you for attending tonight's event at the Graduate Theological Union. I am Jennifer Davidson, and I am the Dean and Vice President for Academic Affairs and John Dillenberger, Professor of Theology here at the GTU. In a spirit of appreciation and respect, we acknowledge that our Berkeley campus stands on the ancestral land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people in the territory of Huichin, previously the land of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We recognize the indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land, and we affirm the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. In my remarks to begin our evening together, for those who may be attending their first event at the GTU, I will give you a brief introduction to our wonderful school and community. Then I will introduce our honored guest this evening, followed by a brief introduction to the Bay Area Mormon Council, who is an essential partner with the GTU as we together work diligently to fulfill a shared dream. An institution of higher learning unlike any other, the Graduate Theological Union brings together scholars of the world's diverse religions and wisdom traditions to advance new knowledge, share inspiration, and collaborate on solutions. Now celebrating our 60th anniversary, the GTU offers certificate programs, master degrees, and PhD degrees in over 30 different concentrations. Drawing on the expertise of over 50 core doctoral faculty members and more than 200 faculty across the consortium, the GTU provides a unique community where scholars and practitioners from across religions gather for the academic study of their own and other traditions in richly interdisciplinary ways. This evening, we are delighted to host a very special event, the welcome lecture for Dr. Deidre Nicole Green, who joined the GTU as rostered faculty on July 1st of this year as Assistant Professor of Latter-day Saints Mormon Studies. Dr. Green earned a PhD in religion and an MA in continental philosophy from Claremont Graduate University after receiving an MA in religion and feminist studies from Yale Divinity School and a BA in philosophy from Brigham Young University. She holds certificates in Africana studies from Claremont and in global mental health, trauma, and recovery from Harvard Medical School. In the 2017 and 18 academic year, Dr. Green joined the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University as a postdoctoral research fellow. Prior to her appointment at the Maxwell Institute, Dr. Green was a summer fellow at St. Olaf College's Kierkegaard Library, an adjunct professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University, a visiting scholar at the Maxwell Institute, and a recipient of an American Scandinavian Foundation Fellowship to research at the University of Copenhagen's Soren Kierkegaard Research Center. Dr. Green is the author of Jacob, A Brief Theological Introduction, Works of Love in a World of Violence, Kierkegaard, Feminism and the Limits of Self-Sacrifice, and several other scholarly articles and papers. Her forthcoming volume, Latter-day Saint Perspectives on Atonement, co-edited with Eric D. Huntsman, will soon be published by the University of Illinois Press. The GTU's legacy of supporting Latter-day Saints-focused areas of inquiry goes back many decades and includes the visiting professorships of Dr. Truman G. Madsen in the 1970s and Dr. Robert A. Rees from 2008 through this year. 
Dr. Green's appointment represents the GTU's first full-time hire of a Latter-day Saints faculty member and will foster even greater depth of interreligious engagement among GTU students and centers. For many years, the GTU has worked closely with the Bay Area Mormon Studies Council as together we dream and actively work toward establishing a Center for Latter-day Saints Mormon Studies. The Bay Area Mormon Studies Council promotes scholarship and teaching related to the Latter-day Saint Mormon tradition, including its intersection with other faith traditions, and serves the greater San Francisco Bay Area through offering lectures, sponsoring conferences, and supporting other educational programs and interfaith activities. Following this evening's lecture, there will be a brief time allowed for questions and answers from the audience. Please submit your questions for Dr. Green using the Q&A function within the webinar. And now I am pleased to turn your attention to Dr. Deidre Nicole Green, who will present her lecture entitled, Joy Enfleshed. Dr. Green, welcome. Thank you and good evening. Joy as a religious concept is too often viewed as an aspirational ideal rather than an essential aspect of human existence. Joy, I argue, ought to be viewed as definitive for what it means to be human, characterizing both individual and collective life. Using the lenses of Latter-day Saint theology, the thought of 19th century Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, and insights from contemporary feminist theologians, Today, I will argue that joy is central to the process of internalizing religious knowledge. We must also come to embody joy such that it structures our very selfhood and realize that it plays a vital role, not only in personal transformation, but also the transformation of the world as it allows us to sustain engagement in projects of social justice. One impetus for these reflections is recent scholarship arguing that trauma has taken on an epistemic and existential authority in contemporary life that outstrips discussions of joy and overshadows joy's possibilities for offering its own forms of authoritative knowing. Amy Hollywood, for example, asserts that within today's society, claims to epistemological privilege depend on the proximity to trauma, and it is trauma, not justice, that makes ethical demands on others. Citing the theorist Dominic Lacapra, she poses the question, in the absence of God, has secular art and criticism made trauma sacred? Hollywood further queries, have pain and violence and anxiety become the real to the exclusion of all else? Ultimately, she asks why we believe in the realness and the truth of the traumatic and yet seem unable to hear joy. Alternatively, Hollywood proposes that joy might also be the site of an unspeakable real. She cautions that our contemporary tendency to privilege the epistemic authority of trauma and suffering results in an attentional bias that leads us to overlook accounts of joy. Hollywood's framing of joy in terms of epistemology helps highlight the unique ways in which the Latter-day Saint tradition makes this connection particularly pronounced in a way that might counter a current cultural tendency to drown out joy and its epistemic authority in favor of trauma. I propose that joyful embodiment is central to a Latter-day Saint epistemology and that this epistemology relies on dialogical relationships with those beyond the faith community who are themselves critical contributors to joy to that joy. This includes feminist scholars who emphasize joy's relationship to activism, as well as Kierkegaard with his notion of joy as a spiritual discipline that affects personal and social transformation rather than a mere affective state. What results is an augmented epistemology that is authentically Latter-day Saint in orientation and aspiration, but one that can only be found through dialogue with other perspectives. The teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints maintain that human beings existed prior to this mortal life as spirits who needed to become embodied for the specific purpose of attaining salvific knowledge and a fullness of joy. The body is considered necessary for human beings to become more like deity by gaining the type of experiential knowledge that is only possible in a physical form. The centrality of the flesh is highlighted by the first prophetic author in the Book of Mormon, who refers to his sacred writings as being useful not only to the spirit, but also to the body. 
Notably, much LDS scriptural language around knowledge and belief is described in terms of the pliability or malleability of the body or the lack thereof. LDS scripture further affirms that individuals apprehend truth through both heart and mind, and that in some cases, divine attestation of religious truth comes through bodily sensation. Two specific statements by prominent LDS authorities underscore the fact that the purpose of embodiment is to gain knowledge and to experience joy. Speaking of pre-mortal spirits as having intellectual knowledge of divine truth without experiential knowledge of it, 19th century apostle Lorenzo Snow declared that human spirits become, become incarnated in order to enflesh universal, universal truths into their individual person. He explains that embodied actions invite the divine to bring, quote, knowledge to this body, and that is the only way we become acquainted with former pre-existent experiences through being revealed to and made a part of this flesh. One of the great Latter-day Saint theologians of the 19th century, Parley P. Pratt, in keeping with the LDS canon, identifies individuals according to their capacity to know by referring to them as intelligences and asserts that they exist in order to enjoy. Internalizing knowledge and joy are primary purposes of embodiment. Moreover, in the Latter-day Saint tradition, joy, which is body dependent, is itself a means to knowledge. Joy has been at the forefront of the Latter-day Saint tradition even before the Church of Jesus Christ, as it was originally called, was formally organized. Joseph Smith, the founding prophet, alluded to 1 Peter in describing the divine encounter that catalyzed his restoration movement, asserting that it, quote, filled him with joy unspeakable. It was Smith's own joyful encounter and the promise that he could prove instrumental in precipitating others' joy that propelled his prophetic project of religion making. The scripture he brought forth itself and emphatically declares that joy is the objective of human existence. Adam fell that humankind might be and human beings are that they might have joy. Because fulfilling this existential teleology requires a body, it seems no coincidence that this declaration of joy is humanity's end is juxtaposed against an emphatic declaration of a fortunate fall. From Latter-day Saint perspective, even Adam's fall forward is what makes the embodiment of the entire human family possible. According to Latter-day Saint scripture, human beings are spirit. The elements are eternal and spirit and element, inseparably connected, receive a fullness of joy. And when separated, human beings cannot receive a fullness of joy. It also holds that a literal resurrection of the body is necessary in part because it is only through the inseparable unification of the spirit with the body that individuals may receive a fullness of joy. Conversely, separation from one's body constitutes a bondage. Physical resurrection is the redemption of the soul because the spirit and the body are the soul of man, such that severing and splitting off the, the mind and or spirit from the body, whether theoretically or literally, makes joyful experience impossible. That the body is necessary in order to experience consummate joy further underscores the body's crucial relationship to knowledge. The interplay of embodiment, knowledge, and joy are reinforced in the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob's discussion of the epistemic significance of resurrection. For Jacob, perfected knowledge requires a perfected body. Specifically, it is only after corporeal resurrection that one can remember and fully know the joy one experienced during mortality. It is only after reunification of spirit and body that those who live faithfully will have a perfect knowledge of their enjoyment. The body remains crucial in post-mortal existence because it allows an individual to retain both knowledge and the capacity for joy. For those still in the mortal, mortal realm, spiritual knowledge requires not just a body and or joyful affect, but also the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, which is itself explicitly tied to joy. Galatians 5.22, as every current and former Latter-day Saint missionary knows, reads as follows. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Latter-day Saints interpret this to mean that the experience of joy implies the presence of the spirit, which confirms truth such that a proposition or a tenet of belief can be known. It is, quote, by the power of the Holy Ghost, the prophet Moroni promises at the close of the Book of Mormon, that ye may know the truth of all things. It is the spirit's communication of joy specifically that verifies divine truth. 
A revelation given through Joseph Smith to his brother Hiram, now part of the official canon, states overtly this dual and complementary action of the spirit, quote, which shall enlighten your mind, which shall fill your soul with joy. The same passage averts that by this means a person can know all things whatsoever she desires. Other teachings suggest that joy not only follows, but allures the divine spirit that authorizes truth. Jedediah M. Grant, a counselor to Brigham Young, once stated, quote, I want the saints to live in a way that they can feel happy all the time, and then we shall enjoy the Holy Spirit. I want to emphasize that again, and then we shall enjoy the Holy Spirit. His great-grandson, philosopher Truman Madsen, a doctoral student of John Dillenberger at Harvard, who subsequently was the first to teach Mormon studies at GTU in response to Dillenberger's invitation, interpreted this assertion thus, quote, we all know that the spirit brings joy. The revelation to me is that joy brings the spirit. When we are happy, the spirit flows more freely. Otherwise, it does not. This direction of fit is significant for the present discussion, given that scriptures establishing a relationship between the spirit and joy are used in the context of epistemology. Madsen's elaboration of Grant's assertion suggests that via the spirit, knowledge can become a function of joy. This is exemplified in one of the most pivotal, pivotal events of the restoration movement. The intense joy that attended Smith's first vision recurred three years later, as Smith encountered the angel who would commission him to translate the plates that became the Book of Mormon. It is striking that in this instance, Smith's joy and ecstasy, as he referred to it, preceded and occasioned rather than followed the visit of the heavenly messenger. How might we understand this trajectory? Although Madsen does not suggest it, I believe his insight points us to another idea that comes from the LDS canon, namely that light cleaves to light just as intelligence cleaves to intelligence. In other words, the spirit is joyful and communicates joy just as it knows all things and conveys knowledge. It may be that in seeking to cultivate joy and knowledge, individuals and communities invite the divine to cleave to them, thereby amplifying knowledge and joy alike. In a way that applies to the Latter-day Saint community, as well as any religious practitioners concerned with creating greater joy, Contemporary theologies further aver that practicing and embodying joy work to expand human capacity for love and relationality, and that a person's receptivity to the feeling of joy can be developed. Pastoral theologian Mary Clark Moschella observes that some people may need to practice to learn how to rejoice, or more precisely, how to open themselves up to the flow of joy. It requires work to experience joy and become joyful, even if that work primarily involves opening oneself up to and attuning to the already present grace that grants humanity joy. Michelle, Michelle's imagery of opening oneself up to a gracious flow is clarified by drawing on the theology of Catherine Keller, who imagines grace as oceanic, something that flows into be human beings if they do not obstruct it. Keller terms this natural state of the divine human relationship, originary flow. Hollywood nicely sums up the fact that joy is both a work and a grace, as Moschella and Keller point to. Quote, spontaneity takes work. It is a cultivated habitus that engenders the full range of affect, including fear, dread, shame, and sorrow, but also gratitude, joy, triumph, love, and ecstasy. This cultivated habitus occurs through repetitive action and enhances the ability to perceive joy or to develop an ear for joy. From the Latter-day Saint perspective, honing the skill and expanding the capacity for joy also develops one's ear for divine truth and salvific knowledge that can contribute to personal and communal flourishing. I maintain that confold excuse me, I maintain that cultivating the, cap the capacity for joy entails learning from others, including those whose religious values and cultural practices are radically different from one's own. We ought to direct attention to how others' bodily actions evince novel potential for living with love and joy in the world. New Testament scholar and former Bishop of Durham, N.T. Wright, observes that in early Christianity, people looked to Christ's followers and said, quote, I never knew you could do it that way. Finding that those practices displayed a way of being human that proved itself to be self-authenticating. As I have argued elsewhere, according to the Latter-day Saint canon, redemption is dialogical, such that flourishing and salvation only prove possible as epistemic boundaries between religious insiders and outsiders are transgressed. 
In the Book of Mormon, for example, the prophet Jacob demonstrates that the lesson of how to truly love and how flourishing families comes not from the prideful, self-righteous religious insiders who betray their own God-given ethical standards of monogamy and sexual exclusivity by commodifying and instrumentalizing women, but by looking to the religious outsiders who function in the diegetical world of the text as the quintessential apostates, yet practice standards of fidelity and engage in relationships of mutuality and reciprocity with spouses and children. In other words, Within the most foundational scripture of the canon, religious insiders are taught that they can only prove faithful by looking to those they view as fundamentally faithless. The fact that joy is a practice and one that is enhanced through redemptively dialogical encounters with religious others helps make sense of the fact that within the New Testament, joy is an imperative and a matter of agency. It does not haphazardly foist itself onto human life, but can be sought, received, and embodied. As theologian Miroslav Wolf notes, although joy can be commanded, joy cannot be imposed. Because agency is inextricable from joy, freedom must be enacted for joy to truly exist. Wolf asserts that joy is either free or it isn't joy, and that's true even of commanded joy. Yet because joy is a desirable state, it seems counterintuitive that one would need to be commanded to pursue it. I interpret the commandment to rejoice and to do so in community with others as a commandment to become intentionally vulnerable, to remain radically open to God, oneself, and others. This openness is imperative because true joy reveals and expresses the inherently relational nature of human existence, which includes the fact that human beings are mutually reliant on one another to become themselves. This objective is accomplished in part only by enabling others to discover joy, even amid suffering and grief which is a profoundly relational process in religious life. Within Latter-day Saint theology, I find no clear resources of how to cope with the vulnerability that joy involves in a way that might alleviate inhibitions around it. Here, Kierkegaard's reflections on joy prove instructive. For him, like the lilies and the birds who are the paradigmatic teachers of Christian joy and maintain joyfulness by casting their sorrow upon God, Human beings ought not only to cast part of their sorrow upon God, but unconditionally all of it. It is only this unconditional handing of everything over to none other than God that allows one to experience joy. For human beings in particular, this care might include concern over joy's precarity. Recognizing and addressing this aspect of care, Kierkegaard contends that the joy that is the peace of God, which comes only through Christ, the joy that passes all understanding is not only the most perfect joy, but also the most trustworthy joy. As he puts it, this joy passes all understanding. So indescribable is it. It preserves hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So different from all other joys, which we must take care not to lose. Whereas this joy takes care of us, preserves us. What reliability. Human beings then need not fear losing their grip on joy because they are gripped by it. Rather than being a quality that one possesses, joy possesses a person. Both God's trustworthiness and the fact that joy keeps one and becomes a part of oneself safeguard against the ephemerality of joy. Trusting the divine can free one up from the anxiety over joy's vulnerability to focus on actively contributing to the joy of the other, including the divine other. Informed by this religious view of joy, the Latter-day Saint commitment to joy might be made more robust by understanding what sustains perduring joy amid its precarity. The current lack of a comparable way of theologizing how to navigate joy's vulnerability may account for why Latter-day Saints speak often of, quote, mourning with those that mourn, as the Book of Mormon formulation of baptismal covenant instructs, but hardly at all about rejoicing with those that rejoice, as Paul exhorts Christian communities to do. Yet to speak of this latter imperative is to recognize the communal aspect of joy, Within the context of the body of Christ, the Spirit's presence and verification of truth is not only contingent on individual actions, but a communal way of being. This way of being incorporates an understanding of the necessity of every member and includes a privileged honoring of those members who are often marginalized, and I would suggest here an epistemic privilege of the mar marginalized. For Latter-day Saints who take the theological anthropology of the Restoration seriously, the question must be addressed in terms of collective practices and perhaps primarily in those terms. 
that can be strengthened by a belief that the divine mitigates joy's vulnerability. It is important to consider here Joseph Smith's appropriation of the Corinthian body for the Latter-day Saint community. He declared, quote, a kindred sympathy runs through the whole body, even the body of Christ, which according to Paul's statement is his church. No one part of the body can be injured without the other parts feeling the pain. If one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And if one member rejoice, all the rest are honored with it. For Smith, it seems, as for Paul, that within the body of Christ, in individuals are not just indispensable to each other, they are actually corporeally connected, so that the damage done to one is done to all. Among other means, such collective damage may be incurred if and when epistemic injustice is committed by silencing or discounting certain types of knowers based on how they are embodied, which leaves all members in a state of epistemic impoverishment. To enact joyful embodiment, then, is to ensure that all members of the body experience the love and justice that make communal joy possible, allowing all to contribute their unique perspectives in a collective wisdom enacted together. Establishing this joyful community that supports religious knowing does not demand overlooking trauma in favor of joy. Instead, it insists upon giving ear to stories of trauma and letting those stories inform communal change, affording the expansion of both joy and knowledge among the whole. In this process, many high ones must be brought low and many low ones must be exalted, to paraphrase a passage of the LDS canon. This will require people with relative power and privilege to humble themselves and become vulnerable by inviting those they have harmed to voice the pain they have endured. As I have argued elsewhere in my work on forgiveness and LDS theology, those with relative privilege must initiate difficult conversations and listen to those who have been overlooked, demeaned, or treated unjustly. Hearing stories that encompass real truth-telling facilitates community and the establishment of a meaningful communal narrative. Conversely, a story that allows us to lie about ourselves or that encourages it is not a story that creates community. Truth-telling and reparative work, like the joy that motivates engagement in these practices, renders individuals more vulnerable to each other. And here again, belief in a divine power that can preserve individual and communal joy could make this vulnerability more tolerable. The project of expanding collective joy must go beyond the boundaries of one's own faith community. Creating context for shared experiences of joy facilitate uniting community amid difference. Audre Lorde calls for cultivating the ability to recognize and appreciate others through joy. She writes that the sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the sharers, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them, and lessens the threat of their difference. Joy is facilitated by and only truly possible within communal practices of justice and love, attending to the various knowledges we encounter in a world of difference with respect, love, humility, and deference avails human beings of the joy that is good for its own sake and that may invite further insight, wisdom, and even revelation. To create a joyful communal life that attends to the vulnerability of everyone requires action, actions that include those in positions of privilege assuming more vulnerability to reduce the vulnerability of those on the margins. And the actions undertaken in this regard bear direct implications for what individuals become and how they know. The action, that action must not be restricted to one's own faith community, but must range through the whole world, anxious to bless the whole human race, as Joseph Smith once described the effect that divine love has on an individual. I now turn to discuss how contemporary theologies and the thought of Kierkegaard can highlight critical connections between joy and social justice in a way that assists communities to flourish on multiple levels and as a byproduct enhances the embodiment of knowledge about how to faithfully exist that can only come with dialogue. An important aspect of this discussion includes theorizing joy as something more than positive affect. While the Latter-day Saint tradition exalts joy, it does not offer clear definitions of what it is. And I fear that intuitions or assumptions about what it means may be too constricted. In the absence of a broader definition, traditional conceptions of joy might offer impetus to cover over painful realities to convince ourselves and others that we are joyful in ways that actually undermine true joy. Moreover, an overly narrow definition of joyous affect vitiates an ability to recognize more mundane encounters with joy, such as being present when others are mourning. 
I believe Kierkegaard offers a more capacious notion of joy that can push forward both the Latter-day Saint and feminist theological discussion to bolster social justice efforts. Like the LDS tradition, Kierkegaard views joy as the telos of human existence, yet it is something a human being is to become, not just something they feel. Further, his view proves useful, particularly in the times in which we are living, because he offers a non-effective notion of what it means to be joyful, calling the human being to actually be joy. For Kierkegaard, a purpose of human life that can only be fulfilled by properly relating to God, self, and others is to uncover and enhance joy as the basic existential mode of the human being over and above despair or anxiety. He describes this joy as being present to oneself in contrast to the disconnection from one's authentic nature that characterizes despair. Returning readers' attention to the more than human world, Kierkegaard points to the wonder of creation that is out there in the field with the lilies, where every human being is what God has made him to be. Tellingly, and in a way that offers a resource for resistance against the privileging of trauma and suffering over joy, Although Kierkegaard's Christian writings are saturated with injunctions to imitate Christ, by focusing his discussion of joy on the lilies and the birds, he demonstrates a valuation of joy over trauma, indicating that joy is the divine will for human existence. He contends that Christ turned believers' attention toward the lilies and the birds as teachers because if he had told human beings to look at himself, then, quote, the earnestness would have become deadly. At the same time, Christ exemplifies a certain type of joy by remaining present to himself and his experience, enduring suffering in the world rather than withdrawing from it. Kierkegaard observes that like Christ and the human individual, the lily and the bird have sorrow, just as all nature has sorrow, yet they are unconditionally joyful. He insists, you cannot ask for a better teacher than the one who, despite bearing extremely deep sorrow, is still unconditionally joyful and joy itself. Such a figure must be one that so thoroughly embodies joy as to be identified with it. Joy must come to be what structures the self. For Kierkegaard, the joy that is presence to oneself and the present time is a contemporaneous way of existing, compatible with simultaneously bearing extremely deep sorrow. The lily and the bird teach how to be unconditionally joyful by unconditionally casting all their sorrow upon God, which I understand to rely on recognition of one's total dependence on another. Although it might be tempting to gain mastery over sorrow and suffering by seeking to control it through sacrifice or masochism, it is the willingness to relinquish control by instead offering up suffering that affords joy. Furthermore, although some might reject a notion of joy dependent on the divine, it is still instructive to conceive of joy as a matter of interdependence, which is only made possible through right relations. In a way that reverses normal conceptions of self-emptying and self-sacrifice, Kierkegaard maintains that it is equally imperative that one not cast away one's joy, as it is that one utterly purge oneself of sorrow. In the case of joy, you are to hold on to it with all your might, with all your life force. If you do that, then you will always retain some joy, because if you cast away all your sorrow, you of course retain only whatever joy you have. The absolute release of sorrow and the correlatively absolute clinging to joy clarify the dynamics by which joy comes to be embodied and constitutive of one's personhood, a change that occurs only through the individual's free choice. Similar, similarly, employing the image of clinging to the good, Kierkegaard illustrates the cohesion of an otherwise fragmented self alternatively in terms of faith. Imagining a form of self-loss as resulting from inner schism, Kierkegaard holds that the division results from doubting God's love. He holds that to give up faith in God's love is to suffer damage in the innermost joint of the self, which makes shipwreck of a person, vividly depicting this person as becoming so diffused that her subjectivity is subverted. Conversely, to maintain faith in God's love, evinced only through monotonous embodied action, is to keep the joint firm, enabling the individual to become and remain whole. The love for God that undergirds proper self-love creates integrity that withstands external pressure, which it can only do by expelling doubt about being personally beloved by God. Connecting Kierkegaard's metaphor of doubt's fragmentation to his discussion of the nature of joy, 
We see that his notion of sorrow correlates to doubt in God's love, and that to cast this away from oneself is to free one up for joy and allow one to maintain personal continuity and cohesion. Moreover, for those who have internalized a message of excessive self-sacrifice as the primary manifestation of love and personal identity, faith in divine love may be most fruitfully evinced by developing one's receptivity to joy. Maintaining faith in divine love in a way that sustains joy in selfhood does not require that the details of one's life are in accordance with one's ideal for it. For Kierkegaard, it is a matter of subjective interpretation, such as viewing the beauty of creation as a divine gift. He advises us to encounter the world as though it were the case that, quote, the sun shines for you. That's, um, excuse me, let me start over. That the sun shines for you and for your sake, that the moon begins to shine and the stars are lit in order to delight you. That spring comes, that birds come in order to bring you joy. To view oneself as so beloved by God as to interpret the remotest aspects of the natural world as evidence of this fact is conducive to joy. In his estimation, to audaciously believe that God cares for you constitutes another way to elicit unconditional joy. Moshella concurs that an awareness of divine presence in us and all creation lends itself to feeling joy in a way that frees one from the paralysis of fear or despair, if only temporarily. For this reason, she advocates fully exploring experiences of joy to gain deeper understanding of God's goodness and love. These reflections speak to the need to attune ourselves to joy and subjectively interpret the world in ways that foster joy, yet not in a way that covers over the tragedies of life or breeds unnecessary tolerance of them. Such attention to divine care offers a concrete way to respond to post-colonial theologian and Joe's call to live, quote, with heart, despite brokenheartedness. She, like Hollywood and others, make plain that joy and not suffering alone must sustain the effort both to recreate and to be recreated. While remaking the world and the self entails sacrifice and suffering, communal and individual joy must be the end goal and the driving force that pervade acts of sacrifice. Joy is neither a luxury nor something that can be postponed to some post-mortal realm. It must be claimed and proliferated in the here and now. While human beings may ultimately need to depend on God for the fulfillment of joy, it is also incumbent upon them to create the conditions conducive to joy for all members of society. Reconfiguring Kierkegaard's dynamics of sorrow and joy for the current societal context, sorrow might represent the acknowledgement of the truth of a devastating reality, and the casting away of sorrow in exchange for the embrace of joy might represent the refusal to be immo immobilized by the devastation. This refusal engenders an ability to acknowledge a possibility and work hopefully for a more joyful collective reality. A Kierkegaardian conception of sorrow and joy, then, illuminates how to do both truth-telling and hope-telling naming real problems and working to ameliorate them without privileging one at the expense of the other. To read Kierkegaard in this way is to acknowledge the role of acceptance in both activism and joy in a way that resonates with practitioner activists such as the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu, who both acknowledge that their activism comes from a deep acceptance of what is, noting that the only way to attain the joy humanity is designed to experience is by giving up denial about what exists. For Kierkegaard, joy moves us beyond acceptance to encourage active embodied engagement with the world. Aaron Simmons observes that in Kierkegaard's corpus, faith does not entail being lifted above the messiness of embodied existence. Instead of being extricated from existential difficulties, those who embrace the life of faith are thrown back into them. Yet because the faithful individual is defined by joy, she possesses the capability of not succumbing to the anxiety that might otherwise convince her to abandon her efforts at striving to create a better world. On my reading of Kierkegaard, joy is a way of being that allows human beings to see difficult problems and sit with them, rather than denying them through a toxic optimism and address them productively. For Kierkegaard, no matter what we confront in our lived experience, we can maintain joy and remain present to ourselves by abiding in God. He goes so far as to say that one is in paradise this very day by so doing, even if one faces death. I want to push this further, relying on his contention that for a despairing self who is overly constrained by the factical circumstances of her life, the battle for faith amounts to a, a battle for possibility, which is the only salvation. 
Combining these aspects of his thought with an eye to social justice, one can understand the divine as both enabling confrontation and illuminating possibilities for change. A more protracted and joyless view of reality is, as he puts it, prone to being, quote, completely wrapped up in probability so that it lacks the possibility of becoming aware of the good. This added notion of possibility offers a productive way to interpret Kierkegaard's injunction to faithfully see joy amid adversity. If one sees nothing but misery all around, then in faith to see joy. Faith always pertains to what is not seen, be it the invisible or the improbable. And it is quite in order that a human being is a believer. Kierkegaardian joy facilitates continual envisioning that recognizes transformative possibilities that can affect flourishing. This vision itself can engender joy, since, as Michelle notes, joy breaks forth when the divine possibility is made known. Along similar lines, Howard Thurman argues that the divinity within humanity is made apparent in choosing how to see. He asserts that there is a bottomless resourcefulness in humanity that ultimately enables us to transform the sphere of frustration into a shaft of light. Under such a circumstance, even one's deepest distress becomes so sanctified that a vast illumination points the way to the land one seeks. This is the God in humanity. Because of it, humankind stands in immediate candidacy for the power to absorb all the pain of life without destroying joy. To see joy in its ostensible absence is to see the salvific, if improbable, possibility of radical change, encouraging active engagement with a world steeped in despair. Returning to Hollywood's comparison of trauma and joy, she insists that the energy for efficacious action comes not solely through melancholy, but also through joy, through a love of the world that in love demands change. The integration of both into our spiritual lives and our engagement with the world requires work on ourselves and work on the world, an unalienated labor in and through which we become who we are. For Hollywood, this work demands that we give up a facile dualism that prizes joy over suffering or vice versa. Quote, not suffering or joy, for we can't have one without the other. We can't live well. We can't live on sorrow and anger and rage alone. By abiding in God, one remains present to oneself and maintains authentic selfhood in the face of suffering, tragedy, and death, and is thereby motivated and empowered to make corrections. In this way, joy can be understood not only as the ultimate objective of human existence, as well as a way of knowing, seeing, and being with reality, but also as countercultural and an act of resistance. This robust and expansive notion of joy, which I believe remains authentically Latter-day Saint, results from drawing together multiple strands of thought. This synthesis follows Joseph Smith's injunction to, quote, gather all the good and true principles in the world and treasure them up especially those found in other religions. Embodying countercultural resistant joy, as I have described it, requires courage, which Kierkegaard defines as daring to exist for the whole range of one's times. Such courage enables joyful existence within current circumstances and empowers personal and social change through ongoing embodiment of our deepest values, which in turn supports effective teaching of those values. As the newly appointed Assistant Professor of Latter-day Saint Mormon Studies at the Graduate Theological Union, these insights lead me to reflect on my own vision for this position. My current specific projects include convening a panel discussion on fu future directions in Latter-day Saint theology, organizing an interfaith and interdisciplinary conference on joy, hosting a summer seminar for Latter-day Saint women working in theology, and collaborating with two other uh, hubs of Mormon studies to engineer a conference on divine finitude and its implications for scripture revelation, the problem of evil and suffering, and social justice. I currently meet with undergraduate and graduate students outside of GTU to discuss issues in contemporary theology and Latter-day Saint thought and hope to create a formal course that would bring feminist and liberation theologies into conversation with the LDS tradition. More generally, my first priority is to cultivate a space in which Latter-day Saint theology receives both critical and constructive treatment. A crucial aspect of enfleshing joy is believing in the divine love for all aspects of the human person, including the critical capacities of the mind. As a scholar and practitioner, I understand that my critical mind and proclivity to question ultimately aid me in loving the divine, myself, and others more deeply and coherently, and thus enable me to better fulfill the commandment to love God, self, and neighbor, rather than vitiating my ability to do so. 
As a beloved LDS apostle, Neil A. Maxwell explained, quote, for a disciple of Jesus Christ, academic scholarship is a form of worship. It is actually another dimension of consecration or rendering one's whole soul and all one is to God. For him, the model of a practitioner scholar demands taking both scholarship and discipleship seriously. The LDS canon further buttresses this claim, declaring that, quote, the glory of God is intelligence. Intellectual reflection, in particular when aimed at better understanding the divine and how to love our neighbors, can be a source of both human and divine joy. Second, I believe that joy and communal flourishing are only possible in the context of dialogue. The Graduate Theological Union can be a space where Latter-day Saints become better informed about other religious traditions and perspectives, and where the theology of the Latter-day Saint tradition, and not just its history, culture, and politics, can come to be better understood by others and Latter-day Saints themselves. This can take place within the classroom, but ought to also be the substance of a Center for Latter-day Saint Mormon Studies, that produces its own publications with a theological and dialogical nature, so the Latter-day Saint theology contributes productively to larger conversations. For Latter-day Saints, this could be a space in which faith gains nuance and maturity. In my own experience, theological study, dialogue with other theologies, and critical thinking about religion enrich my appreciation for and commitment to Mormonism. Liberation and feminist theologies in particular have helped me recognize what is truly unique and efficacious in Latter-day Saint thought, and deepen my determination to study and practice my faith. Third, this dialogical space can prove beneficial to Latter-day Saint theology by illuminating the oscillations that have occurred over time between what sociologists of religion identify as assimilation and retrenchment, and move towards a space of greater integration. LDS sociologist of religion Armin Moss articulates that Mormonism pendulates through periods of assimilation which includes seeking respectability within the wider culture, symbolized by the beehive, and retrenchment, which entails greater separateness, peculiarity, and militance, symbolized by the angel. To swing too far in the direction of the beehive is to lose Mormonism's unique identity, while to swing too far in the direction of the angel is to, quote, lose its very life. These patterns emerge in the comfort level with religious studies and academic theology over the church's history. As Mormonism increasingly becomes a formal topic for the study of theology, and as theological study becomes more of an accepted practice within Mormonism, I hope that there is a move beyond extreme retrenchment that supports individuals in moving past simplistic dichotomies that ultimately undermine engagement with the world and impoverish their faith. Fourth, I hope this will be a space where the study of the Latter-day Saint tradition engages in truth-telling and hope-telling, acknowledging both the trauma stories that Latter-day Saints have endured and the ones that they have caused and continue to cause for the purpose of increasing the possibility of individual and collective joy, both within the tradition and beyond it, through relations with those of other traditions. I recognize that this will be a process, but as Truman Madsen expresses in his reflections on joy, quote, the truth is that all supernal joys take time and discipline and discipleship. By making Latter-day Saint theology a matter of formal academic study and dialogue with other theologies, both Latter-day Saint practitioners and other interested parties open up to the possibility that this study will accomplish what all critical and constructive encounters with religion ought to do, namely confront us with existential decisions that give us a new view of ourselves, our world, others, and God since it is only by demanding something of us that religion can reveal something new to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. What a uh, inspiring and insightful um, and, and truly joyful um, lecture to listen to this evening. I know in our conversations, um, I mentioned that uh, it became increasingly important to me to teach about joy in my theology classes because we were always dealing with such hard topics all the time uh, and really confronting suffering. Uh, and uh, and joy seemed to um, fall off uh, the the radar for us. So it felt really important to um, hold myself accountable to our talking about joy together. So this was 
really a wonderful, wonderful uh, occasion to listen to you tonight. Uh, I invite our audience to um, please uh, submit your questions in our um, using the Q&A function, uh, which you uh, should be able to find on a computer at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, and as those questions begin to come in, um, let me just start with one that's that's occurring to me, um, Dr. Green. Um, I've was reflecting on how um, what you were talking about, it seems like it, it's embodied on an individual level. Um, and uh, I'm curious to hear you reflect on um, how this might be experienced on a communal level. Um, in other words, I know for on an individual level, we may experience both suffering and joy. Um, and I'm curious about how, perhaps on a communal level, when there are moments when the individual cannot feel the joy because they're only feeling the suffering, mm -hmm. do we also rely on those uh, in that moment who can also feel joy um, so that it doesn't all come down to the individual embodiment? I'm, I'm just curious to have you kind of reflect on it on a communal level. Yeah, thanks. So um, so I think from Kierkegaard's perspective, it, it's very individualistic, which isn't surprising given his frame of reference. Um, but that's part of why I thought it was important to show that within LDS theology, right, there are the res resources for thinking about it as being primarily communal, right? Thinking of that use of the of Paul's concept of the Corinthian body and that there's this corporeal connection. Um, and so I think that is really critical in thinking about the fact that joy is only truly possible when we are working to create conditions of joy uh, for everyone, right? And so um, and another piece of that that I tried to address is that one of the ways we undermine communal joy is through those forms of epistemic injustice, where we discount um, certain ways of knowing and certain types of knowers. And so creating justice within our communities, within our societies, um, is what can really expand the possibility of joy in a communal context. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have a question here from Professor Devin Zuber, a GTU professor here. Uh, he says, loved this joyful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, in darkening days of our dysfunctional politics and gloom and doom about climate change, it is refreshing to be reminded that we can't live well on sorrow and anger and rage alone, as Amy Hollywood puts it, uh, and as you quoted in your lecture. Uh, Professor Zuber says, I wondered what uh, Dr. Green might have to say about the importance of joy as something collectively experienced uh, and embodied with others together. I'm thinking of Barbara Ehrenreich's attention to this in secular things like rock concerts and sporting events. Uh, but I wonder if Dr. Green had some thoughts on this for religion and places of pluralistic group spiritual encounters like the GTU. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, um, I mean, within the context of my talk, of course, I think about this in terms of making space uh, for people to share their stories um, of suffering and oppression and trauma um, in order to create change. Um, so one one way to picture this is privileged people initiating difficult conversations and asking. Um, to hear stories of how they have caused pain and suffering in a way that allows um, people on the margins to have their suffering alleviated and to start to create change within communities um, so that communal joy is more possible. So I'm thinking about it in sort of long-term pervasive um, structural sorts of ways. Um, I really like the idea of a rock concert. <laughs> and I'll, have, I'll have to think more about how I can incorporate rock concerts into Kierkegaard's thought, which is not something <laughs> uh, that's that's been done very much. But I think 
you know, one one thing I think about within, for example, the LDS tradition is um, monthly um, fast and testimony meetings where the entire congregation fast for 24 hours, donates um, the equivalent money they would have spent on meals to the poor, and then um, have an extemporaneous meeting where people get up or they're moved by the spirit. Incidentally, uh, there are reasons I didn't incorporate this into this talk, but um, in the Doctrine and Covenants, the revelations given to Joseph Smith, which is part of our scripture, um, fasting is actually defined as joy. I mean, it's actually identified with joy, um, which I think is a complex conversation. <laughs> um, but something like that, like a communal embodied practice of fasting um, that is meant to unify the congregation, meant to turn um, attention towards the needs of the wider community, um, attention to the poor and people who cannot provide food for themselves, um, and to have this extemporaneous um, bearing, uh, bearing witness as people are moved by the Spirit, um, I think is actually a pretty great illustration um, of what this could look like in, a, in a, the context of a religious service. Thank you. We have a, another question here from David Longhurst, uh, who is a member of the Bay Area Mormon Council. Uh, he says, wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Green. Could you please comment further on the connection between interfaith dialogue and joy? How does greater understanding of outside faith traditions ultimately result in greater joy? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so... So we've been talking a bit about Truman Manson and his reflections on joy. The LDS community is well aware of um, the relationship that Truman Manson had with Christer Stendhal and how much he uh, really internalized Christer Stendhal's idea of holy envy. Um, so I think, you know, that's a useful concept here to think about the fact that we can look at other communities and see what joy might look like. Um, as I referred to in um, my allusion to the Book of Mormon, right, you have a really clear example, and in my opinion, you have multiple clear examples that um, even within the existing religious community that has prophets and scriptures, they are unable to live joyfully without looking to the example of the religious others within their context. And I think that there is something incredibly profound about that, that the structure of human life um, and the structure of human beings is, is such that we cannot actually live joyfully without learning from those that are radically different from ourselves, um, what joy is. Thank you for that. If there are any other questions, please um, feel free to uh, add them to the Q and A box. Um, and let me um, let me uh, also ask you this, uh, Dr. Green. You, I loved your phrasing of truth telling and hope telling. Um, and I wonder if you maybe have an example of where you have seen that happen, um, either in a classroom or at a conference um, uh, of truth telling and and hope telling. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, my point with um that particular phrasing is that true joy isn't possible without doing the hard work of facing what's wrong um within within faith communities within society etc that we have to be able to see it clearly um that some of the these unique perspectives on joy that i've talked about tonight particularly assist us in being able to be present with and see uh, the problems of the world clearly and um, and see possibility for change. Mm -hmm. um, I, this brings me back really to the idea of having hard conversations um, and initiating difficult conversations. So I see um, the truth telling as um, maybe initiating um, conversations about racism or sexism within a faith community. Um, and, and the hope telling being the fact that there's a way forward 
right? And so it isn't just that there's this sort of damning history that a, a religion such as my own, right, might have, um, but that we start to collectively imagine and envision ways uh, forward, um, ways of really radical change. I mean, within my own community, of course, in its 200 year history, there's been some pretty radical changes, specifically in terms of what's acceptable in terms of family structure, in terms of what's acceptable in terms of race relations. And uh, while those, while the histories prior to that change are in many ways very lamentable, uh, and there's a lot of truth telling that has to be done there, I also see the change as hopeful. And so to me, it gives a way forward to talk about the pressing conversations that, that we have at this moment in time, um, that even though there are tough issues um, that we face and issues of social injustice that we face, that our history shows that things can become more egalitarian. They have in the past in pretty radical ways and can continue to do so. So that's one example. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it, I know I have found hope also in recounting those moments in history uh, when, when people have acted in ways that now give us hope as well, uh, where people have done courageous things or even small things um, that uh, that can continue to encourage us and feed us today. So it's not always just up to us. I find some hope in that as well. We have no uh, additional questions. Um, do you have any uh, any closing reflections uh, before uh, we say good night this evening? Um, I just like to say thank you so much for everyone who attended. Thank you to the Graduate Theological Union. Thank you to the Bay Area Mormon Studies Council. And it's a thrill to be here and to be able to talk about these issues. So thanks. Wonderful. You know, we did get one more question that just came in. So um, let's go ahead and take some time with that. Uh, this is from Calvin Burke. Uh, he comments, fantastic talk. I was especially moved by your by your lecture, especially the emphasis on joy as a site of epistemic authority. Dr. Green, I'm curious if you, um, uh, if you, uh, I think it's, I'm curious how uh, your ethnographic, if you can comment, this is it, mm -hmm. on uh, how your ethnographic work in Africa shaped your theological work on trauma and embodied joy. That's a wonderful question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So I'll say a couple of things. Um, prior to commenting on the ethnographic research question, I'll say that during um, my years uh, in Utah, um, being employed at Brigham Young University, um, I co-founded a um, nonprofit organization for uh, the, the education and spread of um, African culture. Um, and many, uh, so we, there were dance performances and musical performances and things like that, um, that, that were put on regularly. Um, and a lot of those people, including my co-founder, uh, had been refugees. Um, she was from Rwanda, um, other people from, uh, other countries that faced similar issues. And uh, one thing that was just so beautiful about being a part of that group and supporting that group was to see that trauma does not extinguish the possibility of joy, that people ha had gone through extremely difficult things um, and things that could undo any person. Um, and yet they still um, exerted energy, <laughs> right, in, in creating joy for themselves and other people through music, through dance. And so to me, that was just a profound testament to the human resilient, uh, resilience of the human spirit. But I'll say in terms of my ethnographic research, absolutely. I mean, having um, interviewed women in Botswana, South Africa, and Rwanda, um, I found um, I found also that deep resilience and joy. And one just quick observation. I once interviewed a woman, we were sitting outside on a veranda overlooking uh, the city of Kigali, and she had lived through uh, the genocide, had been raped uh, during the genocide more times than she could actually um, keep track of. She could not even give me an estimate. Um, and 
and I said, how, how did you maintain your faith? How was it possible that you're, you still believe in God after all of these experiences? And she said, and she kind of gestured over the city <laughs> uh, since we were overlooking it um, and said, evil tried to destroy us. Um, and we're still here and the city is still here. And so I think that um, kind of sense that even survival, right, can be a source of joy. Even survival can be a source of, or can be seen as a grace. And when it's seen as a grace, um, it can be a source of joy. Um, survival can be seen as resistance against oppressive forces um, and destructive forces. And to me, that's that's been a really powerful way um, of viewing the world um, and of motivating my own desire to to resist the oppression that I see in my own context. Dr. Green, thank you uh, for sharing those words of wisdom with us this evening. Uh, and it is a, a powerful uh, image for us to conclude our evening. Um, I thank all of you who have gathered this evening uh, to hear our welcome lecture for Dr. Deidre Nicole Green. Um, thank you so much. And uh, we, uh, are, we appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thank Good night. You.